Here, you know, in the Antelope Valley, uh, as as the, uh, the the constituent casework, uh, if you've had any issues with the State Department uh, uh, or any federal agency, or actually even the state agency, these are the gals helping you. Uh, Chris is uh, focused on the veterans as well, and we have uh, we, we're blessed to have probably the the best veteran service liaison uh, between Chris and Francis uh, doing God's work for our veterans. We got a high yes. percentage of veterans yes. out here. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Uh, we've got Garrett in the back. Tammy's our field rep uh, for the Santa Clarita Valley. They're all working out out there. And then we had a few folks from the from the DC staff fly in. I've got uh, a, a great team out in DC. Uh, my legislative director Jacob uh, Gatman is here with me. <laughs> Jacob's the, uh, the the 14 pound brain that helps us when we have an issue, how to figure out how to write, put that in legislative text and and get things uh, passed. Uh, so uh, very successful with that. Uh, we've got uh, Scott uh, Watkins is here floating around somewhere, but he's the legislative assistant. Uh, you met Liam, my comms director, and then we've got Jen, uh, who is the uh, press secretary. So they're uh, the, the team that makes this all happen. So I want to thank them. Uh, I've, I've got the, uh, the PowerPoint slides here. So what I'd like to do is spend 30, 35 minutes going through these charts. I think a lot of the questions that you'll have are going to be addressed here. Uh, I'm, I realize there's going to be questions that you all have. Uh, I'm willing to answer any and all questions, so whatever the topic is, recognize that I represent you at the federal level, okay? So a lot of the issues that we have, you're either the state, uh, county, or local city levels, I'm, I'm happy to give you my opinion on things, uh, but I can't necessarily help legislate or mitigate those issues for you from the federal level. So just recognize we have limitations, and you've seen me weigh in on local issues, even, even though they're not necessarily in my purview, I still participate. I still actually reach out to local elected officials across all party lines uh, and across the full political spectrum uh, to hopefully help us do what's right for, for California. As you know, California is tough to live in right now uh, for a lot of reasons. Uh, my job here, and I've said this from day one, is, is not to necessarily fix California, but to prevent the country from turning into what California has become. Okay. That's what they tell us. Try to it against us when we say things like that. I love the people. Oh, uh, I love the geography. I love the weather. I love the workforce. I love I'm the businesses that are out here. Uh, I don't like the policies. I don't like uh, the legislation coming out of Sacramento. I don't like the fact that we have a very lopsided legislature. Whether you're a Democrat or Republican, we should all see value in a balance of power. We should all see value in having an opposition force, uh, whether it's a Democrat or a Republican. And we don't have that in California. We have one side being represented with a super majority that is effectively running the tables on their policies. And I think a lot of those policies have negative repercussions. We'll talk about a lot of those. But my point is though, is, is that at the federal level, for every policy that we don't like at Sacramento that, that makes our lives maybe tougher here in California, there, there's what I call an ugly twin sister in, of that policy in Washington, D.C. that we deal with. A lot of us don't like AB5, if you recall, that's the bill uh, that, that really crushed independent contractors in California. Again, why are we talking uh, about that California? literally cost tens of thousands of jobs, hundreds of thousands of people left the state because of that legislation. Um, and there's a, a bill at the federal level called the PRO Act, which is basically AB5 for the entire country. So my job is to protect us at the federal level. Uh, I want to start by, uh, oops. there we go, all right, uh, we talked about the intros already, uh, we'll talk about services, we'll talk about some successes for our district, some of the accomplishments we've had in the office uh, in the last year, but also over the last couple, uh, few years, it's hard to believe I've been in office for three and a half years, some, some days it feels like 20, some days it feels like 20 years. <laughs> Uh, we'll give an update on what's going on uh, and look at the priorities. And the most important part, like I said, is a Q&A. So uh, I'm going to, first of all, ask that everyone be civil. Uh, we'll, we'll get to all the questions. We had folks fill out the, the forms, and we're going to randomly no. draw names. My goal is to get to every one of those questions that have been submitted tonight. Uh, if we don't get those questions uh, fully no. answered or if you have follow-on concerns or questions, uh, we'll get you a formal written response that you, you can uh, you can take home and, and digest. Yeah, and as always, uh, come visit us in the office if you guys have any questions or issues on anything. 
I want to thank you guys. Uh, it's been an honor to represent this uh, this beautiful district and in our uh, beautiful country's House of Representatives. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of drama right now in D.C., and hopefully what you're seeing out of me is a focus on drama. our district, our constituents, and above all, uh, our security. And you'll see tonight the, the slide, the common denominator word being security is what I think we all seek, okay? Some of us seek the drama, some of us seek the social media, you know, there's a lot of... Uh, what I'd say are actors and actresses in Washington, D.C. seeking that limelight. I just seek the truth and I seek the security of the nation. That's, that's why I do what I do, that's why I ran for office. So it's been an honor to represent you. I'm gonna to continue to do so uh, until I, I feel comfortable not. Uh, but we're at a precipice right now in our nation's history and uh, we need people who are there to do the right thing and look for our security, so thank you. Um, wow, this thing is sensitive. Um, I'll start with this because it uh -huh. kind of hopefully Your party said sets the not. stage for the, the, the sort of theme tonight. We're not going to always agree on everything, but we are all Americans, okay? The odds of you agreeing with me on every issue are zero, okay? Um, there's no one that agrees on every issue with me except for me, and there's no one that agrees with every issue of yours except for you, okay? So the key is to have those discussions, understand what the differences mm. are. We should seek the truth, we should seek common ground and root cause of our issues, and we should seek to hopefully understand each other. It doesn't mean we have to agree with each other. It doesn't even mean we have to like each other, but I want you to understand at least the rationale for some of these issues and some of these votes. So that's the, that's the underlying uh, theme here. All right, as far as uh, constituent services, this is, a lot of people talk about what are your priorities, right? Uh, the number one priority is constituent services. I, I don't do my job if I'm not representing you and also helping you. And right now our federal government's frankly pretty dysfunctional. We have still in some federal agencies about 40 to 50% of the federal employees not showing up for work. So people that need help with passports, uh, the IRS, Social Security, VA, uh, these folks are still not getting the customer service that they deserve, frankly. So our office uh, helps light a fire. 52% of the casework is coming from the Animal Valley um, district-wide. We've helped the uh, uh, constituents get $2.8 million uh, back in their pockets. One of my favorite stories is a, is a World War II hero. You, most of you will know him. Uh, Lou Moore uh, passed away mm -hmm. a few months ago, but uh, he was, uh, what, 100 years old, right, yeah. Marvin? Yeah. 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 And, uh, you know, the VA was coming after him. Uh, IRS, VA were coming after him for $140,000. And uh, yep. that young lady in the back, Chris, uh, took it up with the VA and, had, had another perspective that they ended up adopting. So we got that debt forgiven for him. He didn't owe it to begin with. But this, had been, this had been weighing on him for years and, you know, actually a couple decades and his family couldn't even imagine being that old and he's got four generations of family looking at $140,000 debt. And so uh, that's the type of thing we do. Uh, 500 constituents, uh, 250 medals to veterans. I see a lot of veterans here. This is one of my favorite things to do. When you get out of the military, you don't always take the time to administratively get your paperwork in order, get your disability stuff taken care of, or even get your medals that you earned and deserve. So uh, we help our veterans uh, get those, and uh, we actually present that to them. So um, it's uh, long overdue in many cases, but it's a huge honor to do that. Community project funding, we'll talk a lot about that uh, here tonight. These are earmarks, okay? Some people don't want to call them earmarks. You can call them whatever you want, uh, but they're earmarks, okay? This is a way for me to personally direct a bucket of money to an organization, usually a nonprofit or a city organization, um, to, to fund them using a federal bucket of money that is already existing within our budget. This isn't new money. This isn't excessive money. This is money already within the existing budget that I get to personally carve out with my office. And, and in fact, the building we're sitting in here uh, right now is City of Hope. Uh, they're a benefactor of an earmark from last year. They put in a, a project request uh, asking for, uh, was it one and a half? Two million. Uh, Two million dollars to create a, a mobile cancer screening van. Um, and we go do a deep dive with them, make sure that they're gonna be able to execute this program. And, and they got the award, uh, we were able to get them the funds, and you're gonna see now in the Antelope Valley, uh, hopefully in the next couple of weeks, maybe a couple of months, this van's gonna be unveiled here by City of Hope, and it's gonna go to the lower income neighborhoods to do cancer screening, you know, mammograms, uh, all sorts of cancer blood work to, to hopefully get to people the preventative help uh, that, they, that they need so that it's not an emergency at the AV hospital, right? So, 
So this van's gonna be saving lives. These are the types of things that they wouldn't have gotten funding had it not been for an earmark, and we can literally pinpoint with high fidelity into those projects. We'll talk about all those here in a second. 15,000 uh, responses, you see that. Um, meetings with constituents, there's a lot. Uh, we basically, you know, people say, hey, what are you gonna do on your break? There really is no break for me. Uh, I come home and uh, I uh, go to businesses, schools, meet with individual uh, constituents, uh, talk about the issues and we help people out. So we're working five days a week uh, and, and even on the weekends we're helping with casework for people in emergencies. We'll show a couple of very unique situations that have happened in the last uh, couple months. Uh, newsletters we do, uh, that should be a greater than sign. Uh, we put out, uh, hopefully you guys are subscribing. If, if you haven't subscribed, there'll be a link here. I try to do weekly or bi-weekly newsletters, especially when I'm in DC, so you can see what's going on legislatively and, and, and give you a sort of glimpse at the drama in DC and the swamp and all that. Uh, uh, but I, I try to put my perspective on things and where I am on the issues. So, so hopefully, especially on the bigger issues, you're not confused where I'm standing on these. It's not just social media posts, but actually emails and videos being sent to you uh, once you subscribe. I had to point at the wall as the key, I forgot about that. All right, so if you need help, these are the types of things we do. Passports, uh, visas, veterans, social security, we talked about these as the grants. If you're a small uh, nonprofit or a government agency seeking a grant and you want a letter of support, we can't write the grant for you. We can't find the grant for you, but we can do letters of support and then really talk it and honcho it to make sure it gets across the goal line. It's a big deal. IRS, uh, Small Business Administration, if you have any issues with Medicare or Medicaid, we can help with those. Um, and the DOJ, we can, we can help with those as well. Uh, and more. There's other things that we can do. We'll talk about some of these uh, these stories here as we go through it. Uh, but uh, we've, we've got a lot of uh, things, a lot of ways we can help constituents. Um, this is our contact information. Again, it's all on our website. You guys know how to use the internet as well. But uh, we're we're right here down the street uh, for our Palmdale uh, Lancaster office as well. All right. Services the office provides. Uh, we also do internships. So if you have, they're paid internships. Um, it's not a lot of money. Uh, and, the, and the interns are the ones that answer the phone calls as well, so uh, you know it's a it's not a glorious job. But if you know someone who's wanting to uh, serve uh, in that capacity, we have internships here in the district, but also in Washington D.C. Uh, Naval or Naval Academy, hopefully Naval Academy, but all academies. Uh, uh, we do uh, appointments for all academies. Uh, that that uh, academy night is coming up on September seventh. Uh, that's going to be in the Santa Clarita Valley, right in the middle of the district. Uh, but it's about a two hour event. So if you have someone who's a junior or senior in high school that is looking to get an appointment to the, the academies, please have them come. They're gonna learn the whole process, what it entails, and uh, uh, be inspired hopefully to continue that journey. Uh, as you know, I was a Naval Academy grad, so this was uh, truly something that, that changed my life's trajectory. Uh, it's not free education, I can assure you, it comes at a cost, uh, but it's a great education. So, um, and you got a guaranteed job waiting for you in the backside. So, uh, we do those uh, roughly uh, uh, 10 to 15 appointments every year, so if you have a student who's interested in that, please uh, reach out. Uh, we have an art competition. This doesn't get too much attention, unfortunately. We, 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 we do an art competition, and the winner's uh, piece actually gets hung up in the Capitol. It's pretty cool to see, and every member of Congress walks by it every day. Uh, we've got uh, ours up there right now. Um, but if you're a school uh, for high schoolers who are in art, uh, this is an annual competition we just uh, finished up a couple months ago. We give tours. Um, if I'm in town, I'll personally give you the tour. If I'm not you know, voting or in a committee hearing, I'll give you the, the, the sort of VIP tour. You can see all the speakers out and everything. So please reach out if you're in town. Um, this is Jamil. Uh, just a couple cases here where we had a, uh, a former Air Force, a Canadian Air Force exchange officer uh, looking for uh, his naturalization. He was getting hung up with uh, the State Department. We helped him get that and uh, ultimately was naturalized. Uh, we had a young girl just a few weeks ago get stuck in Africa. They were there adopting uh, someone, uh, an, another sibling, the mom and dad and then this young girl. The young girl ended up getting very sick um, and was on the verge of dying. Uh, and the, the, I won't say the country she was in here, but uh, they basically weren't letting her leave or get the medical services. So we called the State Department, got emergency evacuation flights in there. Uh, grabbed a few few bureaucrats by the shoulders, and uh, long story short, we were able to get her out in time so that she can get the emergency surgeries, and uh, she's recovering uh, now back here in the United States. That's a that's a good deal. Good story. One of our interns, Trevor, actually met him in Poland uh, when I was there. 
uh, visiting troops in Poland. He was one of the troops, and then he reached out, you know, a year later and said, hey, can I get an internship with you? Kind of a random thing, you know, you just meet this guy in Poland and you're wondering why is he reaching out to do an internship. Uh, he's not from California, he's not from our district. Um, but uh, one of the last days he was there, he saw a kid choking, and a gentleman was giving him the Heimlich maneuver and doing it wrong and actually aggravating it. And this kid was about to, you know, die from, from uh, asphyxiation. Uh, and Trevor reached in there, grabbed the dude that was doing it wrong, threw him off to the side, and uh, gave him the proper techniques and saved his kid's life. So uh, he's not with us, uh, he's still alive, but he's not with the office uh, anymore. But, uh, but, but uh, a real hero here, former Army guy, but also saved a life in the halls of Congress, which is pretty cool. Um, and as you guys recall, one of the things that we were able to do last, or actually two years ago now, was get 115 Americans and Afghan partners out of Afghanistan. <laughs> That, that was literally Charles and I sitting down and, and with our staff figuring out, is this something we can do? Is this something that we want to do? There's a lot of liability potentially with literally trying to help people get out of the war zone, which is what it was at that point. And we were doing it outside of the State Department. We were doing it outside of the DOD and the executive branch, and we were taking a risk. But uh, Charles, to his credit, basically ran an operations center from his house and uh, ultimately got 115 people out. There's still a few folks who are still trying to help, unfortunately. Uh, but as you know, the situation has not gotten better over there. So, but uh, that's one of the big deals that we've, we've been able to accomplish. Uh, these are just uh, collages of uh, the Antelope Valley. Hopefully, you're seeing me in the community. Uh, you know, we're doing everything we can. If there's an event here, I go to all the ones that I can recognize. I've got to also go to the Santa Cruz Valley. I've got to go to the San Fernando Valley, Granada Hills as well. So there's uh, there's only so many things that I can personally attend, uh, with 50% of my time being in D.C. But uh, my staff should also be going to these local events, Jackie, Chris, and, and Francis for the Animal Valley. So uh, just some uh, examples here again. Just uh, this is a, a portion of the things that we've done just in the last uh, six months. Oh, the Navy. So hopefully you're seeing that. Uh, I think it's important for me to come home every weekend. If I've got my rule of thumb is if I've got 24 hours, uh, I'm going to fly home to be with the family. Uh, to be in the district, and I think it's important to, to come back home. There's some members of Congress that literally just live in D.C. And I get it if you're from Hawaii or Alaska, but uh, that's painful, but um, we need to get back in the district every minute we can. Uh, I, I'll start with this. A lot of you guys have heard this, but for me, the, the you know, it's God, country, family, and then, and then underneath that is the, what I call the four C's. Uh, and, and pretty much every issue that you ask about tonight or on the floor when I go to vote or any policy discussion is anchored to one of these four C's, the Constitution, capitalism, Competition, because you can't really have capitalism if there's no competition, right? That's not that's not free market capitalism. Uh, and then that last C is charity. Uh, I'm a big fan of nonprofits. I'm a big fan of, of, of charity organizations because when the federal government spends a dollar, by the time it gets to the streets and the people that need it, it behaves like 15 cents. By the time Sacramento does that, it behaves like 30 cents at best. Uh, county behaves like 40, 50 cents, and the cities behave like 50 to 60 cents on the dollar. But a well-run nonprofit organization, 501c3 especially, uh, will actually see efficiency rates of 80% or better, meaning every dollar they spend is 80, 80 cents. So that's why these earmarks are so important. So a lot of these issues that we have, we have to first ask ourselves, is this the federal government's role to fix this problem? or? Is it the community's role to fix this problem? Is it the parents' role to fix this problem? And the local churches and local charities to fix this problem, okay? So all that waxes into the, the equation here as far as the four C's, but in the end, it's the Constitution, and we'll talk about a lot of that, and a lot of questions are gonna be around some of those things. Um, this is an interesting uh, chart here. Uh, this is something I just found out. This is a scatter plot of every single member of Congress and where they are on the political spectrum. So we all know left to right, right? We all know blue and red, which is silly to me because I'm not a big fan of the parties of Young Freedom. I think we need weaker parties and stronger leaders, but there's clearly two camps that are running here. And I, you know, I, I actually dread the idea of a two-party system, um, but we can, we can talk about that offline. But um, the, the bottom axis are economic issues, and then the vertical axis are more social issues. So 
What you can see here with the scatter plot is I'm basically writing, writing, writing the middle of, of what we would call the Republican pack, okay? Uh, not extreme, you know, you can imagine the personalities on the far right, and you can imagine the personalities on the far left. All that to say, this is representative of a district like ours, which is full spectrum uh, and, and is a tilt Democrat district, okay? Now, I know the Democrats in the room probably don't agree that I represent them on every issue. I, I understand that. But I do think it's important to recognize that uh, when I was in the minority, I actually voted with the majority on 39 critical issues. There's a lot of votes you know, in committees that, that I did as well, but these were the critical issues. And so these, these five, six, or is that five uh, particular bills are the, the sort of higher visibility ones. Um, and I'm happy yeah. to defend to There's my base and to that. other conservatives why I right. voted for these things I when I was in the minority. Um, and we can take that offline, we can do it here, but Respect for Marriage Act was probably the one that raised the most eyebrows, uh, because yep. as a Republican, I wasn't expected to necessarily vote for that, but uh, this wasn't the codification of gay marriage at the federal level. The Supreme Court had already done that, right? The states, in, in most cases, have already legalized it. So what this was, was a recognition that gay couples have the same constitutional rights as straight couples as, as, as determined by the Supreme Court in, in what was called the Obergefell case, okay? So I don't have the, the opportunity to pick and choose who gets constitutional rights. Everyone gets constitutional rights, and especially when it's underpinned by a Supreme Court decision, and, and also by the states uh, for that matter. So happy to talk about that like anytime. No. CHIPS uh, Act, unfortunately, mm -hmm. this was something that got politicized. This was uh, a very important spending bill. I forget the, the dollar value, uh, Jacob, if you remember, but billions of dollars to invest in our own country's ability uh, to manufacture semiconductor chips. Right now, about 95% of the chips, and these chips are the things that go in your refrigerator, your iPhone, your car, uh, in many cases are weapons that the Department of Defense uses, right? Uh, 90, about 92 to 95% of our chips come from Taiwan, and, and those are actually funneled through China before they're shipped to the United States. So we are, the biggest vulnerability we have right now relative to China besides our debt is this inability to manufacture semiconductors. Um, so the CHIPS Act unfortunately got very politicized. Most Republicans aban abandoned ship on it. Uh, and I, I doubled down on it, explained to try to convince as many folks uh, that this was absolutely necessary for our nation's security and ended up passing. Active shooter alert, this is something that didn't get a lot of Republican support. Uh, as well, this was uh, investing in an active, so once there's an active shooter, a, a sort of uh, emergency alert system is, is notified, it goes out on a text, it's, it's, it's fenced geographically, so it's only affecting certain areas or certain schools, um, not the entire district, right, very important. Rim of the Valley, um, this is a, a you know, conservationist movement, the, the, the areas uh, between the Antelope Valley, Santa Clarita, Acton, Aguadulce, surrounding area, those are all protected wildlands. Uh, that are preserves that need to be kept that way. Um, and uh, the federal government uh, should own those. Uh, there's a lot of developers trying to develop in that area. There's a lot of miners trying to mine uh, rocks and quarries uh, in the uh, 14 corridor there. Very dangerous for the environment, very dangerous for our freeways. And uh, so I've, I've got all, probably the weirdest thing about this is, uh, uh, I, you know, I've got this bill and then Adam Schiff has a very similar bill. So this is one of the few instances where you'll see me actually agree with uh, someone like Adam Schiff. But, uh, but he lives on the, in the foothills of, of the Rim of the Valley uh, impact. So uh, and then we voted obviously across party lines to support Medicare. We'll talk about Medicare and Social Security here later on. All right, uh, proven track record for security. In the community, we talked about all this. I sit on the Appropriations Committee and I sit on the Defense Subcommittee. Uh, I sit on the Energy uh, Subcommittee as well, and then I sit on the Commerce, Justice, and Science Subcommittee on Appropriations. Uh, then I also sit on the, the Intelligence Committee. Um, we don't need to go too far into the weeds, but this is the Intelligence Committee is where all the truly classified briefs are happening from a national security perspective. It was weaponized for political purposes in the past, and we've gotten back to the Intel Committee actually being an Intel Committee for national security. And then I sit on the science, space, and technology. So I'm the authorizer and then also the appropriator for NASA and then most you know, space and science programs. That's, that's a big deal for this district, given especially the guys.
Do you guys know the economic backbone of the Antelope Valley, especially uh, is, is the aerospace business. I see a lot of faces from different companies here uh, as well. So um, we've, got a, we've got a really uh, strong position for, for that. Uh, all right, so I'm gonna go through these charts uh, real quick. This will be the, the backbone of the flow here, but I mentioned security is the common denominator. And I'm gonna touch on each one of these facets. And there, there's clearly more facets to security than just these six, but I wanna use this as a, as a starting platform and then we can ask questions uh, later on. But economic security, we talked about the earmarks, uh, that top bullet there. Uh, we'll show you what those earmarks look like. Um, these are, uh, these are within the appropriations budget. Okay, so a lot of folks go, Mike, you didn't vote for Biden's uh, bipartisan infrastructure package. You didn't vote for America Rescue Plan. You didn't vote for Inflation Reduction Act. Why are you taking credit for these projects that are getting money? Well, the simple answer is the money for these projects are not coming from that $6 trillion of obligations that I voted Yes, they are. This, this funding is coming through the annual appropriations budget uh, that I work on yet? every year as an appropriator. Uh, so this is part of what would be normal annual operating budget costs. Uh, we talked about $54 million uh, so far for these earmarks. Uh, FY24 is what we have requested for this coming fiscal year. Hopefully we can pass a budget this year on time. We'll talk about that. Um, and within that 24 requests is another $27 million. So this is actually the highest level that we've been uh, requesting since we started. Uh, and then you can see that the four requested projects for FY24. Um, we have a workshop and we invite all, th this isn't something where, hey, you gotta know Mike, you gotta know staff. There's no inside track for earmarks. We put out a public invitation to participate in the workshop for earmarks. We give everyone the same information. Mm -hmm. It's incumbent upon you to fill out the, the paperwork and do the, the grant request. It's like two pages, it's super easy. Uh, and then I sit down with my team and we prioritize based on what I've seen in the district that the charity has to be uh, effective, they've got to be legitimate, uh, we've got to make sure if this isn't done right, a lot of people go to jail and I want to make sure that we're doing this correctly and responsibly. So uh, there's a process too. These are the four uh, projects that we put forward. Uh, the Emergency Operation Center for Palmdale, 1.3 million. This will give the, the AV a place to go seek refuge in case of an emergency, uh, the valley wide. Uh, the Animal Valley uh, uh, Water Re uh, Resilience Project, uh, small dollars but big impact. This is to help go find more wells and characterize the water table in the Animal Valley so we can actually become more self-sufficient with our water uh, in the valley and hopefully get more agriculture back in the, in the valley as well. Uh, Avenue M Interchange, if you guys have been on Avenue M Interchange, especially during uh, rush hour plant 42, you've seen it's a death trap every day. Uh, you got the railroads, the intersections, so we're trying to uh, help in, in, improve that uh, with this $2 million grant. Um, and then we've got uh, paratransit operations, a $3 million request. This helps people get the transportation to health facilities, uh, hospitals that, that don't otherwise get it, either through Medicare, the VA, or other uh, social service programs. So that's uh, these are the four in the hopper for this uh, FY24 request. Big picture, we're not gonna talk about all these, you would, you would pass out, uh, or I would pass out first probably, but uh, these are the, the 33 that apply to the current map. There's more that we had with Simi Valley uh, in the previous map. Uh, you can see where they are. Uh, the bottom line is, uh, I'm in the bottom one third in terms of seniority in Congress. Uh, working my way up a little bit, but still the bottom one third. Uh, and then I'm in the top third in terms of dollar value and number of uh, projects getting to the district in terms of earmarks. So uh, we've got a fantastic team. Jacob spends countless hours for months making sure that our projects are, are real, they're legal, that they're doable, and that they're going to get funded and, and supported. And that homework uh, yields these results. Um, about a third of the projects and about a third of the money comes to the Antelope Valley. Okay. Um, Remember, I've got Santa Clarita that I represent, San Fernando Valley that I represent, and then the Simi Valley. And some of these projects you know, really uh, benefit the entire district. In fact, the entire Southern Most California. We, we got a, a, a huge grant for the Children's Hospital in LA. They, they had a cure for uh, blood cancers for, for children, but they didn't have the machines to, uh, some of you guys are very familiar with it, they didn't have the machines to actually go filter the blood correctly. So we got them the grant, they bought the machines, and so now if, if, if the kids come in there, I didn't realize it was like a greater than 90% success rate with leukemia with kids. Uh, but it's these machines. That are really, 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 
you can see that that one shows up as number five, right? But it's Greater LA, it's not an Antelope Valley thing, but I think if you have a child who has leukemia, you're gonna benefit from this as well. So that's, a, that's the layout. Uh, these are the specific Antelope Valley ones. Again, not gonna go through each one of them, but to date, we've gotten about 16 million uh, to the Antelope Valley. That uh, that's a big too. chunk out of 54 million, that's about a third, right? Like so, um, uh, and we're gonna keep focusing on that. And, and there's other grants. By the way, the other unincorporated areas like Lake Hughes, uh, Elizabeth Lake, you know, they don't have cities that can necessarily endorse their grants. So we go after other buckets of money to help them lean on the county, and lean on the state to get them. Uh, I know Lake Hughes has just been, cr been crushed uh, with, with, with the flooding up there. So uh, we're, we're working with the county to help uh, facilitate some of those things. All right, here, Marks, like I said, this is actually, this room looks familiar, right? Hopefully I'm not wearing the same suit, but uh, we, we, we hold the earmark form here. We hold one in Santa Cruz, and we hold one in the Santa Fernando Valley. We invite everyone. This is your chance to understand the earmark process. This is real money going to real nonprofits in, in government agencies. So I encourage everyone with an interest to show up. We'll tell you if you don't qualify, and if you do, we'll do everything we can to get you the money. All right, economic security again, you know, uh, I've been very clear from day one, even as a candidate, uh, that uh, I, I won't allow or vote for anything that, that jeopardizes the veterans' benefits. Uh, very clear about uh, making sure that we fully fund the VA, and you saw in the last couple of weeks on the appropriations package, despite the drama and the mainstream media saying we weren't going to do it, we actually did uh, fully fund the VA's uh, last life. This last life. <laughs> That's not the case for nine out of 12 federal agencies, so that is, that is something. The DOD, Homeland Security, and VA were fully funded. The other nine, we can talk about those, but they will not, they will be taking significant cuts, and I'll get the metrics for that. So uh, economic security, uh, lower taxes. Hopefully you're seeing uh, not only voting against these, these massive spending bills, there's three real, you know, three-headed monsters that, that I voted against that, that are the reasons why we have the inflation problem. We have the Inflation Reduction Act, which the president literally admitted last week it had nothing to do with inflation it was, no, it was so that he could fund his climate change initiatives. If you don't believe that, he literally said it with his own mouth, using the words I, I said almost verbatim there. So that's, uh, that's not uh, an Inflation Reduction Act, but uh, bipartisan infrastructure package and then the America Rescue Plan, the three of those totaled $6 trillion of additional spending that was put into the marketplace, okay? Um, and while that may sound necessary in, in the wake of a pandemic, this is on top of the annual spending budgets going from $1.3 trillion a year, which is what they were four years ago, to now potentially $1.9 trillion this year. Okay, so that's a 50% increase on top of our annual spending, you know, and that's still less than $2 trillion, but we've put in another $6 trillion or three times that between these three bills. So I did vote against those. And, I, and no, most of that money, by the way, hasn't even been spent because we, there's so much money for so few people to actually go execute these programs, right? So uh, they're not executable and, and a lot of it won't end up being used for what it was advertised for. Uh, I, I wrote uh, the Inflation Protection Act, or Prevention Act, I'm sorry, uh, where uh, if inflation is ever above 4.5%, which is what we're at, uh, it forces Congress uh, to basically stop uh, adding increases to the annual budget on uh, discretionary. So, uh, the, the president ended up signing the law something completely different, uh, which was to the Inflation Reduction Act, which actually aggravates inflation. So that, that was the problem we had with that. Uh, Fiscal Responsibility Act uh, will set these caps and it will reduce year-over-year -year spending. We can talk about that. Uh, HR1, the first uh, bill that got passed by this Republican majority house was HR1. This is an energy independence uh, bill. I've got a chart here coming up on the strategic petroleum reserves and the fact that uh, we are now more vulnerable than we have been since 1977, 1978, in terms of how much is in our petroleum reserves. It's going to shock you when you see this chart. Uh, this is also while we are spending the, the highest on gas at the pump. So we've depleted our reserves and we're still paying more. And remember the the point of tapping into our oil reserves uh, last year was to lower the price of fuel. That didn't happen, right? Global so it's not like the Inflation Reduction Act didn't do what it was supposed to do, and tapping into our strategic petroleum reserves didn't do what it's supposed to do. And now we're very vulnerable. Now we're, we're buying record high amounts of Saudi oil, uh, Russian oil steel, despite God, the sanctions. Uh, and we're, we're basically uh, not independent. So HR1 
lowers the restrictions, allows for permits, and incentivizes businesses to, uh, to, to drill for oil here in the United States. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot here in California as well that we could tap into, uh, but the state probably won't allow that. Uh, salt fairness, I wanna spend a couple minutes on this, okay? I, you guys know I ran on this. Uh, we're in the midst of this fight right now, and literally uh, one of the most important issues when it comes to the tax bills, uh, the tax legislation, I should say, don't freak, every time I say tax bill, everyone gets nervous and starts looking for the IRS. Uh, tax legislation that, that some folks are trying to push before the end of the year. Uh, if you recall the Tax Cut and Jobs Act of 2017, okay, this is, this is the, uh, yeah, amen, Karen. Uh, this is, it, it was, I'd say 80, 90% of it was good. It doubled the, the, the standard deduction. It lowered the rates uh, for all taxpayers in all tax brackets. It allowed businesses Temporary. to write off research and development funds. Uh, but it had this kind of middle finger to California and New York in there that was the salt cap. So if you have more than $10,000 of state and local taxes, you can't write them off your federal local tax, right? So, and that, that used to, you know, the people in Texas and, you know, Tennessee used to say, well, that's a, that's a high class problem. That's a white collar problem. But it really isn't in California where the average home value right now in our district is about $700,000. Uh, and so if you own a home and have a job, your state and local taxes hit that $10,000 limit basically just, just over halfway through the year. So you can't write off about half of your deductions. This costs us about, you know, on average four or five grand for, for constituent in our district. So it's a, it's a big deal. So I've been very clear with McCarthy, who's our neighbor to the north and the speaker of the house. I've been very clear with the chairman of the Ways and Means Committee that I won't support any tax bill that doesn't address the SALT initiative. And my bill eliminates SALT cap. Uh, I, I'd be okay with a compromise position of doubling it, but I will not sign on to any tax bill, uh, even with all of the goodness of TCGA, unless it, it rectifies this problem correctly. So uh, that's where I'm at. I don't know why that's on speaker, because I do so agree with the speaker. By the way, we only have a five-seat majority, right? And there's, uh, what, three of us from California that are doing the same, and then about four from New York, and you have literally just prevented uh, a tax bill from moving forward. So there are some good things that we can carve out and accelerate the write-offs for businesses on research and development, very important. Uh, we can do that a la carte without putting it in this package. Um, and like I said, you know, this isn't a California problem anymore. Go to Texas and they're hitting the salt cap now, right? So go to, go to and the guys in Tennessee say, hey, we shouldn't subsidize California's tax policies. And I, I remind them, that our GDP is 10 times that of Tennessee. So if, if you, don't want us to subs you don't want to subsidize our tax policy, I don't want to subsidize your revenue problem, right? So that, this is the else thing off track, you're, you're right. So uh, by the way, it's a problem in pretty much every state right now except Tennessee, so uh, we'll get there. Uh, by the way, salt cap expires in 2025. So even if I don't win this, this, this battle, uh, we will win the war when, when it expires in 2025 and we have to pass a, legend, you know, a, a tax bill that uh, accommodates the other measures that were, were the good parts. Okay, so that's a big deal, especially uh, for us here locally in California. All right, this is the petroleum reserve chart I was talking about. If you can't read it, it starts with uh, 250,000 barrels in the strategic petroleum reserve. We started this back in 1975. The first deposit was made in 1977. And you can see we actually haven't been as low as we are in this reserve. We're at roughly uh, 430,000 uh, barrels in our reserve. We haven't been that low since 1983. Okay, so this was the, the national policy that was in reaction to the gas crisis of the, the mid 70s when OPEC banned exports to the United States. And it was the gas crunch that many of you remember. I was two years old sitting in the back of my mom's house. Uh, but but to, to give you a sense of where we are right now, this draw on the, on the reserve was meant to mitigate the gas prices. It didn't work, right? Not just in California, but every state still right now is pretty close to record high gas prices. So I've, I've asked uh, the Secretary of, of Energy uh, in a committee hearing what their plan is to refill this. And embarrassingly, she said, we don't know. We don't have a plan. Uh, and the president right now is not, not showing any indication to actually fill this uh, reserve. So this is one of these things that we, we need to get energy independent, okay? Uh, transitioning to neighborhood either. security. Uh, hopefully, uh, you guys have seen this, but Sergeant Steve Owen, uh, who was murdered in the streets here in the Antelope Valley uh, a few years back, uh, I put a bill uh, together that basically makes it uh, uh, 
uh, a federal crime that is punishable by death if you kill a police officer or like a police officer. You can't do that. I thought you liked state rights. So I'm going I'm to lean on the party to get that one moving a little forward because I think that will have bipartisan support. Uh, uh, we supported about a million dollars of local grants to the LA County Sheriff's uh, primarily earmarks to the Simi Valley PD and also earmarks to the Sheriff's in uh, Santa Frida Valley. We'll, we'll probably be able to do an earmark for the Lancaster and Palmdale uh, Sheriff's this coming year uh, as well uh, for the, the next cycle. Uh, but about a million dollars of other grants outside of earmarks uh, to the Sheriff's uh, last last couple of years. Uh, Co-sponsored, uh, well, the, the marijuana uh, illegal grows. Do anyone see any illegal grows in the fields anymore? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Yeah, There's they're everywhere. Okay. <laughs> not right now, Steve, but I would love to tell you. Let's take it offline if you can, because I want to yeah, make sure we're accusing we're, the Mexican so drug we'll, cartel. We'll, it's but local still people. Some, so if you're still seeing some, please call our office. Uh, and, okay, keep calling. Let us know. We'll, we'll tag up with our team here and make sure we've got the address. We, we feed it all to the sheriffs, and, and sometimes it's just a bandwidth constraint. But if you guys remember two years ago, there were literally thousands of these illegal grows. I remember going to the, the first town hall, I think it was at Pear Blossom, uh, outdoors, and I got a cartel dude sitting in the front seat in a jacket, he's got a block. Jesus Christ. And he, so as I'm speaking, he's showing me his pistol while I'm saying we're gonna take this down. And it's right. like, you're literally here with a gun threatening me at a town like hall. Seems like it didn't happen for a thousand hours. see it all, literally thousands of these illegal grows. So we got the money to support the operations, uh, we got Villanueva on board and committed to taking it down, and then our local sheriffs did, <laughs> did, did God's work with the DEA. What is it, they're flashing God's work? A couple counties actually came so. in to help us because of the problem in San Bernardino as well. So, uh, I want to thank uh, the, I was going to say the troops, but I want to thank the deputies uh, for, oh for, for your work and your eradicating this. <laughs> A few hot spots. We're, we're more than happy to help facilitate that. And, we'll, and then what they've done is they transitioned to indoor grows. Okay, so now we've started other other techniques to go out to indoor grows. Uh, it's crushing a lot of folks. Is the air conditioner working here? No. No, it's, no, it's very hot in here. So, uh, maybe we can open the door at least and maybe see if the. Uh, it's hot, right? It's not hotter. It's hotter out there. Sorry about that, guys. Um, I guess it's 100 degrees outside. Um, VAWA, I'm sure you guys will have questions about it. Uh, there's multiple versions of Violence Against Women Act. I supported uh, the clean author reauthorization of the existing Violence Against Women. There were some versions that had red, red uh, flag laws or unconstitutional and there should be laws some. in there that I wasn't going to support. This is a good thing. This protects women of domestic uh, victims of domestic violence, uh, primarily women. Uh, it got it got reauthorized. So that's a big deal. And I was a co-sponsor of that. Halt fentanyl puts uh, fentanyl on the Schedule 1 uh, drug list, it currently isn't. Uh, we've got some stats on how many folks have died of fentanyl uh, in our district, uh, and the numbers are staggering. Anyone in here know someone who died of fentanyl uh, overdose? Nope. And it's not overdoses, by the way, these are poisonings. Okay? Most of these kids don't even realize that they're taking something that is made out of fentanyl and it's killing them, so um, uh, that's a big deal. Um, so getting this on Schedule 1 allows us to prosecute the drug dealers, and the people that Generally kill kids with citizens. fentanyl at higher felony levels than we've been able to. Oh, it's hot in here. Uh, introduce the FIRE Act. Uh, we can talk about this, but this basically brings firefighting capabilities at all federal government levels into the 21st century. It, it allows us to fight fires like we would have war. We uh, I've met with uh, federal firefighters as well. These guys, these guys are out there doing God's work on a daily basis. Even when there's not fires blazing, they're still out there clearing brush, doing prescribed uh, preemptive burns. <laughs> Uh, they make about, uh, I think it's less than $15 an hour doing this. Not when, in California. When you're at the county, you're making two to three times that. So uh, we're looking at ways to get the federal firefighter uh, agencies, the forest guys, level set with their peers, especially in California. We, we need the federal and the, the forest guys to be. We must get working the forest. Uh, and then atmospheric rivers, there's a lot of uh, science and investments and technologies to predict these Which atmospheric rivers. Science. The atmospheric rivers ended up being worse than the, the hurricane that we had uh, last week. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, these atmospheric rivers bring a lot, of, a lot of rain. We should be able to predict those better and then store that water better so that when we're in a drought, uh, we've got more water resources. So, uh, Edison, not as big of a deal in the Yellow Valley, but in Acton and Agua Dulce uh, and then Santa Frida, the, Edison was doing these power shutoffs. Look at that wildland firefight. There. there you go, guys. I'm with you. I'm with you. Um, 
But uh, PSPS was, were these preventative power shutdowns that were, uh, Acton was without power for three and a half days, and the winds were like 30 knots uh, back in uh, 2020. Uh, they have electrically run wells, uh, so they don't just lose their house power, they lose their water, and they have animals. So I worked with Edison, and they, with their infrastructure improvements on the grid, when you look at their charts, it is heavily biased into our district, and we're not seeing these PSPS events like we saw in 2020, uh, 2021, so hopefully that's that's been a bigger deal. These are the grows. We talked about these uh, already uh, before and after pictures. It was just disgusting. Uh, this is this is one of about 500 of this size uh, illegal grows out this mountain. Why are we focusing on this stuff? Outside. All right, school security. I want to pick up the pace. We can do the questions. Uh, school safe, uh, the Safe Schools Act uh, basically reprograms COVID money into hardening schools. Okay, there's a lot of levers that the school districts have to put individual alarms and locking mechanisms on each classroom. Not all schools have that right now. Uh, more gates, fewer points of entry. Uh, so this money would be reprogramming COVID into those uh, hardening of schools. Uh, the School Security and Students Act. Um, would, would uh, provide funding from the federal government for local public schools to hire two resource officers uh, and up to the school district whether these resource officers are armed or not, but uh, for every 500 students. So if you have a school, an elementary school, like my, my, like my son's, my seven-year-old goes to a school with 700 kids, then we have four resource officers paid for by the federal government, okay? Uh, it doesn't sound like a lot of money until you multiply the number of schools and then you have to account for annual training, uh, refresher courses to keep them up to speed and new tactics. Uh, but this, in my opinion, is very important, whether they're uniformed or not, again, up to the school districts. Uh, but what we shouldn't have more security on Capitol Hill than we do uh, against our softest and most precious targets in our schools, in my opinion. So they deserve security. Yeah. No. Cash to Classrooms is a product of having meetings with the superintendents and the school boards out here in the Antelope Valley and Santa Clarita Valley. I didn't realize uh, when I first took this office that the way California calculates its funding for schools is they get a bucket of money and then they look at that school district or that school's attendance rate. And in the Antelope Valley, we have some elementary schools that are like 86%. So they lose 14% of their funding because of that attendance, which is like, it's regressive. It actually hurts their attendance because the teachers spend more time chasing kids and talking to parents than they do teaching. Mm -hmm. And so what this class, uh, uh, Cash the Classroom Act does is it, it requires the states, and by the way, there's only five, go figure California is one of them that uses this, this ADA formula, but it requires them to fully fund schools if they're taking any federal funding, okay? And, and this basically now makes attendance not a punishment to the schools. Uh, this will average about a 10% increase to funding to the classrooms, or to the schools, I should say. It's up to the schools whether they give a 10% you know, pay raise to the teachers or, or use that money to go hire bus drivers for better transportation or hire buses for better transportation uh, or for resources, books, they can do all of the above. But 10% when you talk to these schools is a crap load of money to our schools. And so I don't understand why California does this. It's punitive to the schools. Kids can't control necessarily when they go to school. Parents can't always control. And when we're, when we're in a, an era where we're told not to come to school, uh, if you have any okay. symptoms, uh, you're literally punishing the schools for abiding by the policy, oh. which is silly. So this will, this will end that uh, ADA practice. Social Security, I'll be brief on this. I've been very clear. I will not support any bill that jeopardizes Social Security, okay? You have signed a contract with the U.S. government. The minute you provide a dollar into Social Security, you have solidified the terms and conditions of that contract with the government. The government cannot and should not change those terms while you're in the middle of, of executing that agreement. I don't care if you're 25 or 85. This is a contract with your money, which it is, this isn't an entitlement. This is your money that you paid into it in an agreement between you and the government. So we've got to keep it fully funded. Now, there's challenges with it. Uh, Medicare, same thing. We've got to keep that fully funded. Too many people rely on this. Uh, but I will not support any, any uh, legislation that puts uh, Social Security and Medicare in harm's way at all. Uh, so, and these are a couple of bills that we've been pushing. <laughs> All right, National Security, uh, hopefully you guys saw this too. I wrote a bill, when I was in the minority, I wrote a bill called the Spouse Licensing Relief Act. This is for our active duty spouses. And uh, the way the old law was is if 
you were on active duty, if you're, if, you, if you're on active duty and you have a spouse that is a licensed professional, real estate agent, nurse, doctor, teacher, and you got orders from you know, Texas to California, your spouse would have been required to recertify in the state that you're going to, which for teachers can be a long time. Imagine being a dentist, a nurse, a doctor, that could be years in California and thousands of dollars. And these aren't families that are above the poverty line in some cases, right? So they need that second income and they don't have the, sort, the resources to pay for that certification every three years when they get moved. So I wrote this bill as actually a result of talking to the Edwards Air Force Base Commander, uh, General Tiger, if you guys remember him. Tiger. Um, Tiger. He said, Mike, I've got 12 qualified teachers who aren't allowed to work in the Antelope Valley because they can't get credentialed. So we wrote a simple, very simple bill. Uh, Jacob and I sat down, we talked about the odds of this passing and we didn't want to bullish on it and all of a sudden it passed the house then all of a sudden it passed the senate and then all of a sudden president biden signed into law in january of this year so that's yeah because biden knows what the fuck is up you can let's get started so when you discuss. talk about why the, the, the staff is important this is jacob literally taking something no one had thought about putting it in writing and now helping 180,000 families realize a dual income option uh, for our active duty and right now with the record low retention and recruitment that's a big deal What's the difference? Uh, secured the highest pay raise. Uh, we can talk more about this. The troops start at $22,000 a year right now. It's insane. It's about $11 an hour when you normalize that for a 40 hour work week. Uh, that's unsat. We, we want to truly maintain an all voluntary force. We've got to pay them at least uh, what minimum wages in California. We give our overseas so, troops um, their Fast food workers at, at In and Out are making mm -hmm. $22 twice as much as our military. So, I rewrote the pay tables myself, literally sitting at my desk in, in each cell, uh, making it start so that an E1, the first rank, starts at $31,200, which is the equivalent of $15 an hour. Still too low in my opinion, but it's, a, it's still a, a close to 40% increase. This will be the biggest increase for pay for our junior enlisted that our country has ever had. Okay, so that's a big deal. It passed the House. I think it's going to pass the Senate. And I think an executive branch would be out of their mind right now in this environment not to support paying our troops uh, above the poverty line. About a third of our troops are on food stamps, uh, to put things in perspective. Uh, we talked about the 115 Americans. Uh, we talked about the military aid to uh, uh, Ukraine. I'll, I'll talk a little bit more in depth on that here in a second. Um, and then I, I continue. What's one of the cool things about this job and the committees I sit on is I, I, you know, I get to meet with the president of Taiwan, uh, the minister of defense for Japan, Korea. Uh, Israel. These are these are obviously key figureheads making national security decisions for us too, uh, not for us, but that impact us. So that's a that's Hello, a big deal. Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine. Anyone here in here going to ask a question about Ukraine? No. Okay. So we'll just okay. All right. So we'll uh, we'll get to. If I don't answer answer your question, we can get to another unit. I supported the first forty million dollars of, of support for Ukraine. Okay. Uh, I have not supported subsequent uh, investments in, in the effort for a few reasons. Uh, first of all, the first tranche, we've gotten a very good ROI. The nation of Ukraine exists, Zelensky's alive. They started for to now. back some of the region uh, in the Donbass area, Luhansk, Donetsk, and they're actually starting to win some of the little cities and villages back. Okay? No one expected them to survive for a year and a half like they have, and they, they have done that. That's because and by the way, we didn't send you know forty billion dollars of cash like like we did with the Iran nuclear deal. This wasn't a pallet of cash. These were primarily uh, totals that come from weapon systems like stingers and and javelin missiles. And those stingers were going to be put into surplus for the U.S. military, meaning we wouldn't be able to use them because of the expiration dates on them. So these weapons are going to turn into pumpkins, and we had an opportunity to. By the way, these weapons were made for those targets, right? Those Stinger missiles were made for those Heinz helicopters that the Russians fly. Those Javelin missiles were made for those Russian T-72 tanks. That, that's not hyperbole. That's why we made them. Uh, and we weren't going to use them because we weren't going to fight a war against Russia. And they're getting ready to expire. And so we had an opportunity to put weapons that were about to expire against that perfect target match into the hands of Ukrainians who were fighting effectively for their own independence. And that was a huge ROI. So good job. They've been overwhelmingly uh, surprising everyone on, on how well they've done. The problem I have now, though, is that I can ask any one of you who's winning the war in Ukraine right now, and you probably can't answer. I can ask. I can. Uh, they're, they're clawing regions back, but it's not clear 
exactly where the, the front lines are and what the actual strategy to win is. Um, that's true for most members of Congress. And what I haven't seen this executive branch do in the last year is explain to the American taxpayers why we need more money. Uh, he's gonna be asking for more relief for Ukraine here shortly. Uh, I'm gonna be opposing it because he hasn't, he hasn't communicated to the American taxpayer what this money is gonna do, where we have the oversight and accountability, and, and we have an obligation to taxpayers. Now, if we look at it and go, hey, that's value added, yes, it's gonna end the war, then that's great, that's a different conversation, but I haven't heard that yet. So, uh, with everything going on, our open border on the south, the uh, southern border, the, we issues don't have an open Hawaii, border. Uh, the issues that we're gonna have in, in, in Florida, pray for mm -hmm. them as this hurricane comes in, uh, we can't just blindly say, we need to do whatever it takes to support Ukraine, which is what this president is saying. He's saying we will do whatever it takes. And that, that's not okay. That's not a strategy, right? Uh, so that's that. We can go on. Any, any more questions, questions on that? Or is that pretty mm -hmm. much answer? Right? Super yeah. Super exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's real easy. You just said it's much better to actually use these resources where we've built all this equipment for these particular targets. And they're willing to fight for us and we don't have to send our troops. Exactly. Right. Yeah, one of the one of the challenges here, and we can go you know into the QA with this as well, but one of the challenges is is we've actually hit a limit. And I've had meetings with the Secretary of Defense as well as Secretary of Commerce who they, they figure out the trade agreements, right? And they enforce the trade agreements. Um, we, we've reached, reached a point where we're actually starting to handicap our own ability to defend ourselves against China, for instance. Right? We have a no. capacity problem where we can only build so many munitions. And so I'm not necessarily opposed to helping Ukraine, and I think it's very important. By the way, what we got out of this is what not is just uh, Putin taking a major hit domestically and on the global stage, but Chairman Xi in China, who's the head of the CCP, you know, he saw what happened and he slowed his role when it came into annexing Taiwan. I was convinced that he was gonna do that last year and saw what happened in Russia, and that has rethought thought his, his, yeah, his, his strategy Ukraine. slowed him down, right? Now, we've we got to prevent him from doing that and put a meaningful deterrent still, but the investments in, in, in Ukraine and, and the fruits that we got out of this so far in the last year and a half go beyond just helping Ukraine. It helps us on the global stage. And it actually, when I visited Japan, they, they actually have uh, increased their military spending by 250% as a result of what's happened, because they see China now as potentially doing the same thing. Korea, same thing, almost doubling their DOD investment. So there's a lot of fruit that we got out of 40 billion. I'm not saying we don't do it, I just say if before we do more, especially in an unlimited blank check, we've got to make sure there's accountability and that there's a strategy to win. And that's you know what's called the Weinberger Doctrine uh, that we learned in the Vietnam War. So uh, we can come back to that. Charlie Wilson's work too. Charlie Wilson. We don't pay for something. Exactly, we, we commit and then we, yeah. we just keep writing checks. So. Uh, we had uh, Secretary of the Air Force, uh, Frank Kendall, here at Plant 42 a couple months ago. We had about 100 companies come visit the district, some of them from outside of California. Uh, we had the head buyer of Pentagon show up. Uh, we had the head development director office uh, supporting the, the conference as well. The goal of this uh, was to get exposure for the Aerospace Valley as a place to invest in and continue to bring in this big... My, my goal is to make it so that, you know, right now we have jobs looking for people. And I, I want to make sure Plan 42 keeps the growing, that these jobs, jobs keep coming here, despite the headwinds that we get from California. And other stuff. Um, we've done a great job of that, fully funding pretty I much every major program out of Plan 42, and it's, it's growing like, like, uh, like wildfires. That's great. Uh, but uh, we also need to figure out how to go faster, how to build weapon systems faster. China builds two ships per month. We build two ships per year. Okay? Well, that's, that's ours will stay afloat. They There's one. times as many planes a year than we do. Right, so that, that goes to the people in that room figuring out how to go faster. That was the point of that. But that was right here, right here yes. our precious little Plan 42, so that's a big deal. Holy cow. Border yeah. Security, uh, talked about this, uh, five million uh, folks have come across the, the border illegally in the last three years. Uh, that includes 13,000 unaccompanied minors. You see the fentanyl deaths, uh, these are uh, you do uh, in 22. Uh, fentanyl deaths, uh, and I think we've got uh, about half of this already this year. So this is this is killing our kids. This fentanyl is coming across our southern border. It starts on the slow boat across the Pacific Ocean from China with the, with the precursor ingredients. The pills are then manufactured very cheaply for like two cents a pill in Mexico, and then they're smuggled across our southern border. Yes. Okay? 
Uh, not every pill kills, but the problem is these guys aren't like you know high-end pharmacists and pharmaceutical experts. They they mix it like it's a batch of cookie dough, and just like in a batch of cookie dough, there's that clump at the bottom. They still make a they still make a pill out of that clump. And if your kid takes that pill, they're going to die from it. Two two milligrams of, of of fentanyl will kill your your child. Okay. By the way, it doesn't matter if your child's 12 or 35; it's going to kill them. And these are the numbers in 2022 where parents walked into their kids' rooms at 6.30 in the morning to wake them up for school, and they died at 2 in the morning because they took a pill that was delivered to their front porch at 10 o'clock the night before. So you have to pay attention to this. We've got to have, you know, educate our kids not to take any pills, uh, only prescribed pills, uh, but we've also got to secure our border, and this fentanyl is, is killing our kids. About 100,000 Americans died last year of fentanyl poisoning, and it's coming across our southern border. This is why... This isn't a political thing. We need we need yeah, to secure our border, and that's that's the, the, the gist of it here. So the details are there, but uh, we have a piece of legislation on that. All right, talked about what we signed into law already. Uh, we've got the NDA passed. We've got the uh, junior enlisted race uh, working through authorization right now. Uh, this is what's in the hopper. We talked about most of this already, but this is sort of a one-stop shop for all the legislation that we're actively working right now. I go meet with Democrats. I go meet with chairs of, of the committees uh, to try to get to. Uh, support, especially when we're in the minority, and we need bipartisan support for a lot of these things that are very important. So, all right, looking ahead for me, it's just a simple acronym. We talked about the four C's, but uh, these are the four things you know: simple, safe, acronym, uh, accountability. security, accountability. By the way, we, we do have to hold people who don't do their jobs accountable. <laughs> oh, that's funny. I'm sorry, that's funny. We all have that as voters at the polls, right? You can hold people accountable, mm -hmm. not rehire them, not reelect them. We can do that in Congress with oversight, the hearings, impeachment, really et cetera. We talk about all that. Uh, it's about making sure we keep our freedoms and that we get the economy going uh, back in the right okay. track. So, impeachment? Uh, like, with that, guys, when we talk about the economy, that, that we're $32 from trillion of debt. We have record high inflation now for three years. It's up to about 25% of inflation. Okay, that's real. It's not going to go away. It's not going to reverse. Uh, and, and we're in a hurt locker right now economically. Record high mortgage rates. If you're yeah, looking to buy a home, that's getting high tough with record high prices. And if you're looking to rent a home, that's going to get tough as well because the homeowner has to pay the mortgage and you've got to pay the rent, right? So that's it's going to be a, a you know, wall's closing in on us here economically. And, uh, it already has. You guys feel the pain. Which is why I started, by the way, with the economic security. I know that that is what people are focused on most right now. This is what we feel every day of our lives. It's very important that we, we mitigate it. Um, all right, we talked about all this already. Um, Again, I just want to thank you guys, uh, and uh, here's the office contact. So with that, we'll go to the Q and A. We've got Scott over here on the right side. Uh, we've got Garrett over here on the on well, stage right, stage left, um, and then we're going to randomly just call numbers. We'll call like three or four at a time, so you guys can queue up and you know, feel free to ask whatever questions you got. So they split them. Okay. All right. So uh, just make sure that you held on to your uh, your ticket that you got if you want to ask a question, and uh, once you come up and line up. Uh, behind either Garrett or I, uh, just I give it to us and we'll uh, hold up the microphone for you to ask the question. Uh, first number that we will call is 284155. That's me. Next will be 284168. Next will be 284166. I promise I'll be nice. As much as I don't want to be. We'll go with the first three. There's stairs there. Yes. 